So um, the, what we present today, it's the outcome of a team effort, like for uh, more than half a decade with uh, Matt, with Anne-Sophie, Kim, Guillaume, Yiying, James, and uh, Juliana. So there's one point in the title, which I would like to highlight is that we will talk about forest management. And so we've seen some results, for example, by Edouard, which were uh, land cover changes, but just to make things absolutely clear, uh, today's presentation is about forests that remain forest, but it means that we can change. We can change from an unmanaged forest on the left, we can keep similar species, but we can go to managed situations or we can change the species and the management. And we can go to like, for example, a short rotation or some coppice kind of systems. This is in contrast with the, uh, for example, presentation by Edouard, where we were talking about afforestation, reforestation, which really means that we go from a crop or a grass, we go to a forest or the other way around. So just remember, we're talking about forest management. There's no land cover changes um, being discussed in our results. So when we talk about forest uh, management, I guess first question we need to ask, is it possibly important? And so we used adecovariance data, which were paired, more or less paired, not necessarily. In some cases, really from an experimental point of view, there were nice pairs, one next to the other. On other sites, they were like a 80 or 100 kilometers apart, but still quite similar. And so we compared these adecovariance uh, observations. And we got some data from remote sensing where we searched for areas where we thought that from a physical and climatological point of view, they were very similar, but there was an administrative border crossing or running through the area. And because of this administrative border, sometimes the management was different on one side of the border and the other, resulting, for example, here in a change in albedo. Uh, northern part is Norway, southern part is Finland. And this is the effect from reindeer herding. And we just ranked those pairs, combined them, uh, and you could see the results here. And the red line, it's the effect from the uh, management changes. So you can see that overall the effect is a bit smaller. The blue line is the effect of the land cover changes. And overall, it's a bit bigger. But given the type of problem we're talking about, and what we would like to, to, to see, we can say that these effects are more or less the same order of magnitude. It's maybe one is like a one degree and there are 0 0.75 or something, but it's, it's not that land management has a much smaller impact than land cover change. So then next question, and this would have been suitable as an introduction, but given that we're the last talk, I think uh, we could see it more as some kind of a summary. It's how, does land management affect the climate? And it's a bit, uh, some basic slides. So for those of you who've been involved in this type of science, this will be boring, but for others, it could be nice uh, to have it all in a, a single animation. Basically what's going on, we have incoming radi radiation from the sun. Part of it is directly reflected on the clouds and the clouds, we get them because there are some condensation nuclei in the atmosphere and we have some water vapor. So that's responsible for the cloud formation. Some light manages to go through the clouds or pass by the clouds. It's reaching the surface area and some of the light is reflected and some of the energy is reflected right away. It's going out. Other energy is absorbed by the earth where it is uh, basically transforming the short wave radiation in long wave radiation. And this is where it's getting, I think, most interesting is that the absorption of short wave and long wave radiation is very different. And so CO2, it's a very efficient absorber of this long wave radiation. And so basically the CO2 prevents the long wave radiation from going out of the atmosphere. As everything is more or less in balance, incoming and outgoing are equal. And so the temperature of the earth should be more or less constant over the longer term. So now we add fossil fuel emissions to this story. It's relatively simple. We burn CO2, we add, or we, we burn fossil fuels uh, that create CO2, we add CO2 in the atmosphere. And so we have more CO2, which means that we absorb more of the outgoing radiation. So old proposal, I think it was first made somewhere in the early 70s already, is that we can use forest. We use forest grow. They're clearly, they're obvious carbon pools and forests, which we know as the wood. And so by growing these forests, we will take CO2 out of the atmosphere and we will put it in the forest. 
and another way of storing some of the carbon, which received a fair amount of attention, especially lately, is in wood and wooden buildings and landfills, etc. So these are two ways to, to get some carbon out of the, the atmosphere. But, and this is something that has been suggested also a long time ago, but is only receiving a, some um, attention lately, is that if you grow a forest, if you take up carbon, there is no way around emitting water. It's, it's impossible. These two are just physiological linked. If we use natural photosynthesis, this will happen all the time. So we can affect the atmosphere by removing CO2, but at the same time, we will change the atmosphere by emitting some water. Another issue that's happening is that plants, they emit volatile organic compounds, and those can function as condensation nuclei. So if we grow plants, we will change the concentration of these condensation nuclei, which can change the formation of clouds because both water and nuclei, nuclei are changed. So we can affect how much light is reflected right away. And this is the topic of uh, the last day and a half, it's reflectance. We change the forests, which we, we change the land surface, we will change the reflectance of the land surface. And so we'll basically change the partitioning between the heat that's going being absorbed by the earth and the long wave emitted radiation. So let's start with reflectance. And I don't think I need to spend a lot of time on this, but there is a plenty of observational evidence that forest management changes the surface albedo. And this is, I think, a really nice picture from a Canadian a, um, field experiment. Again, it has been said before, same disclaimer, what we see, it's not the albedo, but clearly it gives you an idea that depending on how you manage your forest and how you shape even your, your forest, you can get very different shaded areas. And so when you shade the snow, the reflectance will be less than if you don't shade the snow. This uh, is very obvious. Some of these effects are much more subtle than we often expect. So if you remove a forest cover through a harvest by cutting or it's removed by a fire, you can see that the albedo is different during some seasons of the year. So some of these effects can be quite uh, subtle. So then second, what happens with the evapotranspiration and is there an effect from forest management? I think again, uh, we can say yes, there's overwhelming evidence. First of all, everybody who had some plant physiology will know that we have different types of leaves, different bark. Uh, so this will affect how much water and how easily the water can leave uh, the plant. So this is the first um, driver of the transpiration. But then these are results from a study where they try to split uh, evapotranspiration and see what explains it. And then you can see that several of these top um, drivers are really related or can be affected by forest management. So there's species, there is a, the diameter, there's the height, okay, diameter and basal area, they are related, but these are things which are typically managed by, by the foresters, also number, number of stems. So through forest management, we will affect a, the, the, uh, very, the um, transpiration. And so then to uh, continue a bit with what Philippe started is the changes in roughness. So on the left hand side, you see a picture from a uh, central Finland. And on the right hand side, you see a picture of central Finland. So both sides are a couple of kilometers away from each other. But this is a classic, a managed forest, Finnish management. So with the kind of a relatively small scale clear cutting and some thinnings in between. And this is conservation area. And I guess you can clearly see the difference in the roughness here of this canopy, the interface between the forest and the atmosphere. It's very, very different. This has been con um, confirmed by measurements. And here on the right hand side, uh, this graph, the uh, Z over H or Z over H, uh, when it's one, it's the height of the canopy. This is where the canopy starts. Um, and so here you can, you can see that the impact of the uh, canopy, it increases already above the canopy, it's maximum at the interface, and then it decreases again a bit when we, when we penetrate the canopy. And it's different colors, we see here, it's different density of edges. So these are a rows, rows of trees, and it's basically the shelter effect of a tree that's shown here. 
Uh, but again, you can see that even these shelters, they differ just by the density of the shelter, how many trees we plant in them. So this is related to the roughness. The impact of the roughness, it's uh, seen in the turbulent fluxes, so both the latent and the sensible heat. And here again, there is one, I would almost say like random study out of quite many options we have um, showing that uh, whether we clear cut or we have a um, only partial clear cuts, like a thinning or clear cuts, so you see that we have differences in these, these fluxes. And maybe this figure may, may not be so impressive, but some of these differences, it's like tens of watts per square meter, which is in the whole uh, energy budget, it's quite important. So, and then come to the last component, which are the biological volatile organic compounds. And those has been mostly absent uh, today. We had the presentation about biochar, where there was a reference to black carbon, which uh, is related to this, but it's not exactly the same. But what we, what we know is, first of all, different plants will emit different BVOCs. And so uh, here we have a Quercus and a pine species. And then we have another deciduous, like a Platanus species. And all those, these, these two are deciduous. This first one is emitting a monoterpenes and the second one is emitting isoprene. So there's already different BVC that's being emitted. But then these two, the pine and the uh, oak, they're emitting monoterpenes. So they've, they're emitting the same BVC, but you can see that at similar locations close to each other, um, they have a very different um, very different uh, emissions of the BVC. And I started stuttering because I noticed that this is the wrong uh, citation. This is a citation from, it should be a group, uh, citation from the group of uh, Franco uh, Miglietta, who is, uh, I think, present here uh, today. So sorry, sorry for that. So I changed the figure. I did not change the, uh, the reference. So that brings us to the, or this is an overview, I would say, of, of how we know that forest management can affect the climate. And I think the good news is that this is more or less a known, and we don't expect to discover many new interactions between the land and the climate. So if we manage to account for all of these, I think we can probably start saying that we can uh, uh, estimate or understand the climate impacts of a forest management. And I now give the floor to Oud to continue with the results. Uh, thank you, Sebastian. Um, so, so as Sebastian has uh, convincingly shown, when we change the structure of the management of the forest, we change many surface properties and the exchanges between with the atmosphere. Uh, but now, if we want to, we understand, as he said, we understand all the pieces separately. We, we have observed them. But now, if we want to put them all together and be able to evaluate the combined effect, we have to use climate models uh, combined with land surface models. So the climate models are very great because they, they couple the functioning of the biosphere, the atmosphere, and the ocean through the modeling of the water cycle, the carbon cycle, and the energy energy exchanges at each of the of the interfaces. But uh, it was also a bit said in Philip's presentation before. These uh, no, you can come back. Uh, these models they still have a, a very rough presentation uh, representation definition of the vegetation. So basically, usually for the vegetation for the forest, they use they define it as a, a uniform homogeneous volume of biomass which is a problem uh, if we want to, to look at the impact of forest management. So what we did uh, to be able to evaluate the impact of forest management, we had to adjust the model, which was also the a version of the Orchidae model, uh, same, as, um, same family as the one Philippe shown before. So the main uh, changes that we had to make to the model was first to change the carbon allocation scheme in order to be able to account for the competition for light between small and, and higher, bigger trees. We also changed the canopy radiation transfer so that the light uh, being transmitted would account not only for LAI, for leaf area index, but also for tree density and tree height. Uh, we also parameterized the model for species 
instead of just uh, broad uh, functional types, as Sebastian showed before, the species, even within a functional type, can have very different behaviors. Uh, we also implemented a hydraulic architecture scheme in order to account for the, the impact of water stress and how it changes with the tree height. Uh, and of course, we implemented the management practices. So we have, uh, you can see here a summary for the four main management types. So you have a non-managed forest in, in green. We have a high stand with uh, some thinnings during the lifetime of the stand. Uh, copies management and short rotation copies. And so for each management type, we can see the effect on the standing biomass, on the residues on the site and on the wood products. So now using this, this adjusted model, we were able to look at, to answer the question of, well, to address the question of did forest management uh, cool the climate in a historical perspective. So for this, uh, we reconstructed what happened in the last 250 years of forest management in over Europe. So the land use change that happened uh, in Europe since 1750, it was composed mainly of a forest management change with a very important increase in the fraction of conifers. But there was also a change in the structure of the management with uh, much a reduction, a high reduction in the unmanaged um, stands and an increase in the high stand, uh, more productive management type. And there was also some land cover change with uh, 196,000 square kilometers of afforestation between the two periods. So using this, uh, this realistic scenario, we're able to, to look at what was the effect of this change in management over the European climate. And we're able to to distribute the, sorry, to, to decompose the effect on the different uh, the components. So zero has, has moved, it's supposed to be just a bit below. So all zeros you will imagine they're a bit below. So with this one, what I wanted to highlight is that the main question was, did European forest management cool the climate? And was the answer here is no. We had a, a small, uh, significant, but very small increase in summer, summer temperature. And now if we look more into details, uh, into the, the numbers in the table, so this is the next thing I want to highlight in this table is that, for example, if you look at uh, the compared effect of land use change, so that's, uh, no, okay, so that's land cover change. And so the minus 0 0.7, the minus 0 0.6, you can see that land cover change, so the afforestation and the species conversion, the increase in conifers, they have basically the same or uh, a change in atmospheric carbon that's of a similar magnitude. They both uh, create a carbon sink. But if we look at the other columns, next, you'll see that they have very different effects on the top of the atmosphere uh, balance due to the surface. So very different radiative effect. Another example in the same is a, that shows a bit the same idea is that if you compare the, the, the effect of next, the effect of forest management, so move all zeros a bit down, you compare the forest management effect with the wood extraction effect. They both have the same uh, top of the atmosphere radiance effect with minus 0.01, that's small. But if you look at the effect on the other variables, uh, so next, you see that they have, so uh, again, everything a bit left, a bit down, if they have very different effect on the surface temperature and on the carbon balance. And a last, a last point we can highlight uh, in this table, next, is that in the end, so here we're comparing land cover change and forest management. So you expect that land cover change, that afforestation, that's a big change in the surface properties. Whereas forest management, there are more subtle changes. There are changes in the structure of the forest, in the species. But in the end, we see a higher change in surface temperature from, from forest management uh, with 0 0.10 than from land cover change, that's 0 0.02. So in conclusion of this, of this study that we did, we could conclude that 
bio, so here we included biogeophysical and biogeochemical. Next. And what we can see is that they are not exactly the same, but they are the same magnitude. They are comparable. And the net effect, well, we found the warming, but the net effect is very small. So now the question is, is will in the future uh, climate man forest management uh, mitigate climate and cool the, cool the surface? And in particular, we can uh, raise this question in the context of the Paris Agreement, because so the, there are three articles in the Paris Agreement that can refer to, to forest management, when in Article 2, uh, the aim is to hold the global average temperature well below 2 degrees increase. The Article 5 describes how we should uh, enhance the sinks and reservoirs of greenhouse gases. And the Article 7 calls for the reduction in the need for adaptation. So knowing uh, what we have learned with this historical study, we wanted to see if uh, maybe with um, stronger changes in forest management, but can forest management help us achieve the Paris Agreement and cool the climate? So for this, we, we used the same model. And this time, starting from the 2010 forest management, we implemented uh, several scenarios of future management. Here we did something uh, pretty novel that we, we implemented the change in management in a realistic way. So we didn't just cut all the forest and change and try uh, different management uh, scenarios, but every time there was an opportunity, we changed it. So if there was mortality or if it was a harvest time. And for each pixel, we tried several combinations with uh, Re replanting the same species with the same management or the same species, but changing the, the harvesting type or changing the species, but keeping the same management or changing the species and the management type. And in the end, with all these scenarios on the, all the pixels, we were able to recombine for each pixel, the one the, for each pixel, the scenario to make a portfolio of over Europe, what is the best, the best combination of management that would allow us to reach, to achieve uh, each of the Paris Agreement objectives. So the, uh, having a stronger sink, having a brightest, the brightest surface, or having the lowest uh, surface air, air temperature. So when we did this simulation, this is what we found. So if you look at the top left square, you have the average over, over Europe. And the, the row, the column in the middle, it's the business as usual. So that's the same pie chart as before with the majority of conifers and the majority in blue of high stand management. And you can see to the left, what is the management portfolio over Europe that would maximize the carbon sink, the carbon sequestration. So you see that to maximize the carbon sequestration, we would need to increase the fraction of conifers and to increase uh, in orange, the portion of unmanaged forest. And to the right, you can see uh, what is the, the management portfolio, the management combination that would uh, reduce mass, uh, maximum uh, at the maximum the air temperature. And you see that here it's the opposite. We need more deciduous and we need more copies that are lighter uh, than, than the high stand or unmanaged forest. And now if we look at what it means for the different regions, we can, we can look Finally, at the, at, the, at the business as usual for the different regions, you see that in Northern Europe, basically we're already, we're very close to the maximization of the carbon sink with a lot of conifers and, uh, and a lot of high stand. Whereas uh, for, if you look at Southern Europe, we are very close to the management that maximizes the air temperature reduction that minimizes temperature. Whereas in the temperate, uh, in the more middle Europe, we're a bit in the, in the middle too. So now if we try to look at what is the physics that explain this, this pattern, if you look at the map on the left, you see for the winter months, for two winter months, uh, February, March, you see where the temperature reduction uh, happens in the scenario where we, might, where we minimize the temperature. And you see that we, we succeed to, to minimize temperature, but mainly in the snowy areas. So in, Nor in Scandinavia and in the Alps, uh, that's where the temperature reduction happens. 
And to the right, you see the, for each latitudinal band, the decomposition of the temperature change uh, based on the different uh, physical mechanisms. Uh, so you see that to the left, you have the physics that minimizes, that reduces temperature. And to the right, you have the physics, the mechanism that warm the temperature. And so the first thing to notice is that there is a balance between both. So th there is a partial compensation of the, of the physical mechanisms. And here you see that albedo, uh, so that the light green, it's indeed uh, one of the important effects, but the emissivity, that is a change, uh, it's a dark green, it's changed through the content of water vapor in the air, so the effect of transpiration, for example, and the circulation of these variables, they are the ones uh, together that, that create the, the cooling effect. So that's the cooling that we obtain in winter, but now if we step back and we look at the time series over the year, so you have to the left December, January, then February, March, etc., till the end of the year, and see that the, the cooling effect, we already saw especially that it's over the snowy areas, but it's even confirmed when you look at uh, spring and, and summer where we don't have uh, so much this effect. But what is also interesting is that some of the, of the mechanisms, they, they switch signs uh, with, uh, with the season. For example, the G, so that's the um, orange, coral, it's, it's, uh, it's sometimes warming and sometimes cooling. So that's very interesting and that points to the fact that we're, we're modifying complex systems that have complex interactions with the atmosphere. And so we can just cool or just warm. It, there are interactions in the, in the physics. So next. So what we can, so will the forest management cool the climate? We can say that in location with uh, substantial snow season, deciduous trees help to cool the local climate because of the, of the snow effect. There is a strong difference between conifers and deciduous uh, in, in winter. So here there is a, a clear effect. But then we need to account for all the processes and they're all important. So this, there's not a single proxy for how to cool the climate. And next. And so this is, I'm going back to the, to the illustrations that Sebastian used before because to highlight one point that right now in the models, we manage to have water, to have CO2. We even have nutrients now, but there is one thing that is still missing. It's the condensation nuclei. And in a recent study by Kaliukoski, where they were able to model uh, the effects of carbon, albedo, and uh, BVOCs, you can see BVOCs in green, and you can see that their, their effect is of the similar magnitude as the albedo effect. At the, you, on the x-axis, it's the intensity of the management. So it's a percentage of, of harvest of the, of the forest increment. So we have more aggressive or less aggressive uh, harvest scenarios. But what is, what is interesting is that the albedo and the BVOC effect on the radiative forcing are of similar magnitude. So maybe that's what the models are, are missing for now, uh, where we are now, if we want to really have the complete climate impact of forest management. So now I can conclude. So when we manage uh, the carbon balance of a forest, there are many unintended changes in surface properties. And we need to account for this and not only focus on climate as is uh, very often done in, in politics. Um, and yes, forests may cool the earth, tropical afforestation, it's clear, but there is very little evidence that European forest management did and will. And now some perspectives, some afterthoughts. We, we may wonder, and maybe we can discuss it in the question, but is the effort and the risk worth the potential climate benefit? Or should we focus our efforts instead on sustaining the provision of ecosystem services and working more on forest resilience than on forest miti on carbon mitigation. And maybe instead of maximizing the sink, forest management could maximize yeah, the provision of all ecosystem services with, uh, that could be looked at with multi criteria analysis. While of course, trying to maintain the, the greenhouse gas balance within, within check as one of the, of the criteria.